Hello to the Chicas and the Chicas, I'm back at you with yet another book review. I did not intend to make another one as close to the previous one as it is now the case, but ladies and gentlemen, I've got a big announcement to make and that is none other than the Book of the Year award has been handed out as early as on the 9th of 10th by the time this video is released on the 10th of February because Ivan Sokolov's Winning Chess Middle Games Volume 2 The Essential Guide to 1E4 Pawn Structures has been released. It's now on the market and uh, suffice to say that I'm blown away by how incredible this book is. I want to hug it. Uh, you get to see the author if I do that. So I will do that for you. This, guys, is just pure chess joy in a book. So, yeah, I will be absolutely shocked if in the remaining 10 months of the year, uh, rather 10 and a half, I will see a better chess book than Ivan Sokolov's winning chess middle games. Before I get into the nitty gritty, and this is going, this is going to be a very difficult book to review because its content is immensely rich. And so I almost can't do justice. In fact, I certainly cannot do justice to the book in a 10, 20, 30 minute video. Um, so I'm facing a really tough challenge here. A couple of things to put forward about the book. Just like his D4 book, also titled Winning Chess Middle Games, by the way, the yellow one, this one also doesn't have all the possible potential um, pawn structures that arise in chess. So now I'm already contrasting how lucky I have this one on my desk. Uh, Flores is uh, Rios's book to Sokolov's in that he only discusses about six pawn structures all up. However, this is a conscious choice and I really, really respect the author for this. He says it in the preface that to write a book of this caliber, he doesn't say that, but I'm adding to it, adding it to, to really make it clear, about all E4 pawn structures is a borderline impossible task. And so he cherry picked some, which he considered to be the best, and he presented that. Now I'm going to read out a little bit from the preface because I really, really think that what he says there stands ultimately very true. Um, as for the opening lines that I did find their ways into this book, I wanted to analyze the positions thoroughly and the material presented is predominantly aimed at um, improving the reader's playing level. I have tried to present the knowledge I have acquired during 20 years as a top-level player, plus a coaching career of 10 years, working with some of the world's best players of today, in an accessible way, so that the readers of different chess levels can benefit from it. Now, this is one of the most ambitious claims ever, right? So here is a dude who has been a really, really strong super GM for 20 years. Then he has been known now as one of the best coaches on the planet. And then he says, I'm writing a book for you and it, I'm trying to make it accessible for a wide range of levels. And yet he actually delivers in that in spades. Now, before I go on, I would like to stress that this book is very advanced. So it doesn't quite reach to every level. I would say that entry level at the very best is 2100 feet, a maybe 22. But from there on up, it's open to everyone. And what Sokolov really managed to nail, among other things, is that despite the incredible depth and density of variations he provides, he explains his lines really well. He does rely on engine lines quite often, but he explains the engine lines and very often uh, he actually dares to contradict the engine or at least go as far as saying something along the lines of according to the engine, it's triple zero, but good luck for black or white or whatever, you know what I mean, to hold this position or to, to you know, be able to navigate the jungle of variations arising from the position. So it does have a really, really human touch to everything that is in the book. Once again, the, the lines analyzed are deep, they are rich, 
but never did I feel that uh, as I went through certain games or uh, analyzed the, the positions offered, offered by the author, that they, they got too heavy, I felt overloaded by the variations provided and so on. Somehow it always felt that I had a very smooth narrative and, you know, analysis provided where I got enough to really feel like I'm being engaged, but it didn't overload me so that I felt like I was analyzing one game for seven hours and Lord knows what I was going to get out of it. So, super, super ambitious book in the sense that it really um, aims quite high. And once again, I would not recommend this book to anyone. Fide 2100, I don't think it's going to be much use, uh, but uh, definitely above. As a matter of fact, um, to say something very personal if i were to re-enter the chess arena as a washed up international master that i am now this would quite likely be the very first book that i would study in really really great depth now let's go into the nitty-gritty what's in the book um if i'm not mistaken six yes six six chapters but more than that structure starts off with the classical rouser sicilian a really really cool chapter with many fresh examples goes on to the marozzi bind he then talks about the marozzi bind against the, the accelerated dragon then goes on to the uh, hedgehog super fun super fun stuff there he then moves on to an entirely different story which i'm going to model to you which uh sorry sveshnikov still sicilian and then he goes on to the french and the french winnova and then he ends up with some e4 e5 structures petrov italian trendy italian lines and trendy rui lopez lines rounding off a marvelous book let me show you an example of what's in this book that i really really liked um, the French Winova was um, an opening that sort of carried me, not carried me, but uh, like something that I worked on in my entire life because I have always been a dominantly E4 player in my career. And for the most part, I played Knight C3 against the French. And at the very early stages of my career, I was very successful with it because my opponents didn't know how to play the French properly. However, when I hit 22, 2300 Fide and I met you know, similarly uh, rated players with similar level of knowledge, I realized that I did not understand the Winova the least bit. And in fact, I got so fascinated by the Winova that I started playing it with the black pieces just to develop a better sense for what was going really on there because I felt like I was just completely in La La Land. Let me explain to you what I'm exactly talking about. I used to play this line exactly... Uh, as white is playing here in Mekking Korchon, except that I used to play it with bishop d3 first, and then after f5 I would take take, and after bishop g5 I already felt like, oh man, my position is so good, and that was just my La La Land vision of this uh, whole entire story, until quite later down the track, in the very late junior years of mine, around the age of 18, 19, I started analyzing this, and now I'm going to follow the uh, line of the game and I realized that theory started about you know not even here like we are just approaching the the crucial position of the opening hereabouts when different ideas come to the fore and different strategies evolve and my concept initially was that oh in the French I always has a, have a space advantage and two bishops and I'm just killing it and when I started analyzing these positions a bit more in depth, I realized that, if anything, as white, I'm actually a bit short of space because these pawns restrict me a lot, in particular this bishop. Um, the purpose of this bishop is a little bit unclear. And black has a lot of easy moves. Bishop d7, queen out, rook across, bishop back, bishop back. All of a sudden, I just realized that, wow, this is so easy to play with black and Korchnoi here. Uh, delivers an absolute masterclass um, in this uh, game and that goes like this so queen a5 hitting c3 covering c3 bishop d7 rook fb1 a weird move to attack b7 it really doesn't uh, deliver at all queen c7 knight h4 rook f8 look at how beautifully Black is deploying the army, and according to the engine, Black is already way, way, way ahead. Um, the final nail in the positional mastery coffin is going to be the rerouting of the bishop, knight g6, 
kicking the knight and allowing the bishop to assume this absolutely sensational diagonal. Um, bishop g6, yeah, rook a2, we had to defend c2, knight e7, you already see that this bishop is coming to e4, rook b2, I mean, that's 10 points of pieces completely wasted there. Knight f5, another motif that I learned the hard way. That e4 square is the most dominant weakness in the position. I mean, we all grow up, right, in uh, the knowledge that, oh yeah, in the French, this is a weak square. And now we are being taught a very painful lesson about how actually e5 is completely inaccessible and e4 is going to be the square where the game is decided. And Korchnoi mopped up the game like the absolute trooper he was. I'm going to blitz through this, but you do get the gist of the whole business. And that was my other um, love story that all oh, French kingside attack. And then you get a move like g5 in your face and you go like, hang on, it's me who is supposed to attack here. And now this is not happening. And after g5, I can't even take off course because... Uh, we get mated on f1, so that's no bueno at all. Um, so white drop back to a1, rook f5, um, rook f1, bishop c2, and the wheels are coming off. So yeah, I'm just gonna blitz through uh, the rest of the game, but as you can see, an absolute masterful performance by Korchnoi. So then the author contrasts this game as being an ultimate example for what black strategy should look like, and perhaps I should have presented this uh, to you from black's perspective, with a game played a fair bit later by Anand against um, Timma. And uh, the way how he does it, I love it, because instead of presenting the next game, he first just shows you a diagram, like that, and look what it says. A happy scenario for what? So in order to help your understanding, instead of immediately jumping into the next game and going like, and now I'm going to show you how not to fail as miserably as Mekin, he goes like, have a look at this, folks. Let's have a compare contrast. What's the big difference here? Well, first of all, there is a black pawn on g6, which means that this rear out is not possible. Additionally to that, in this game, the black bishop, the dark squared bishop of whites, was locked in by the pawns and was a passive bystander in the entire game. Here he goes, look at that monster on e5. So let's see how this scenario occurred. And now he takes us on a journey with Anand Timman um, about two decades later. Exact same opening, exact same concepts. Look at that. Queen h5, and this is, by the way, the move order issue here that black couldn't quite follow. h6 here loses to bishop h7 check, which is a very cute idea. Okay, loses is not quite right. It's still playable. King f8 is a move here, but king h7 is known to theory as really, really problematic here. White's attack is um, very, very strong, and black is going to struggle majorly to stay alive. So long story short, g6 is forced. And then after queen d1, now we are going into the um main line and the game with knight bc6 now in order to give you a bit of a feel for what sort of uh lines and comments you can expect from this book i'm here going to go on a tangent and follow the uh, sokolov's analysis and comments at least what i singled out i didn't quite follow and copy everything out but i want to show you a couple of things here so instead of knight bc6 he says that black he can also play slightly differently following a different plan with queen a5 and he offers the following analysis bishop d2 c4 bishop back uh, knight c6, knight f3, bishop d7, castles, king g7. Um, note that we had some plans of conquering the dark squares already, hence king g7, and hence knight g8. But here, now black is in major trouble, because it's very clear that the white pieces will be able to conquer the dark squares, in particular d6, and gain an advantage. But we still don't stop because there is a fascinating idea here for black with queen takes c3 sucking an exchange. And now the, the game is just insane because actually he both white and black, I checked, played out best engine moves for like 
10 moves back to back, a4, double x clam. The idea is to play a5 and then trap the queen with rook a3. Hello, not bad chess. Knight f6, black counters with the threat of knight d4. Know that that wasn't playable because of bishop e5 check. So now we need to defend d4. Now knight e4 comes. Then there is pressure on f2. There's uh, d6 is hanging, so we need to now respond. Rook a3, queen a5, takes, takes, c3, and concludes his line. Tada, another grandmaster game. This is how Topalov, Yusupov, went with an eventual white win. And then he adds even on top, and note here the names, right? So he's using marvelous examples of top, 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 top games. And then he goes all the way back to knight c6 and says, there is a different story here. Black can go knight d7 instead, which is quite a peculiar idea when this knight comes here and this knight comes here, which by the way is a non-concept in the knight d2 French with white. And look what happens. Knight c6. Now the e5 break might be on the cards even, so white needs to be careful and strike immediately at the e5 square. But we already know that this is, you know, double-edged. Let's go with that because now the bishop is locked in. Yes, the space advantage is white, but it comes at a cost. Knight f6, e4 square, castles, bishop d7, easy moves for black too, by the way. a4, rook f8, bishop f3. All logical moves, covering the e4 square, knight d8 x clam with the idea of trading the knight. And I stopped here, he doesn't. And he explains all these moves. And this eventually led to a draw between Sergei Karyakin and Magnus Carlsen. So now you do see the, the level of analysis and the level of moves offered in the book. And once again, I just showed you these two lines, but these lines have multiple side variations further down the track, which he also explains and analyzes with great detail and uh, remarkably useful commentary. So back to the game, so that we can have a bit of a comparison with the Mekking game. So here we don't have the Queen A5 ideas introduced or rather mastered by Carson, but instead the Knight C6, one Knight F3, C4, back, Queen F8, Queen C1, same concept that we saw before when black had to play king g8, uh, king g7, knight g8. Black wants to, sorry, white wants to conquer the dark squares, the black squares. Knight f5, keeping eye on bishop h6, h4. A very annoying move, given that white hasn't castled yet. The threat of h5 and then taking on g6 is really, really strong here. Black has to do something about it. They played h6, bishop f4. Now h6 is really, really tender. G4 may be a pending threat later down the track. Not quite yet. Um, <clears throat> hmm. What happens if we do this? Take, 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 and then, yeah. Okay, that's an interesting line. Take, 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 and then queen is hanging, h5 is coming. Yeah, black is dead lost. He just wanted to check what was the story with the loose bishop. Uh, bishop d7, knight e5, and tada. We are at the position that I showed you before the game. And now it is Anand who does a masterclass on how to convert this position. So we are now doing a full reverse of making Korchnoi. And this is no less of a masterclass. And note that in every single example I quoted so far, we had world-class grandmasters playing with both colors. So that is always a testament to what a quality book you are reading when the actual games and even the quoted lines in the analysis are just top grandmaster games. H5, G5, and castles. Everything comes right on time. Incredibly well played game by Anand. Now F4 is on the ready right before Black would gear up for E5. Knight E7. Black wants to go knight f5, but this is too little, too late. Knight c6 back, bishop h2. So now with the a really clever tempo to and fro here, here, here. If now black went back to knight e7, then knight f5 wouldn't threaten with the fork on those two pieces. Rook g7 was played instead. Bishop g4, stopping the pawn in its tracks and preparing for more pressure on e6. Queen f6, rook e1. Beautiful piece pile up. 
See, even top GMs must complete development before they go in for the kill. And going in for the kill, here it comes. Rookie 2 gives out the pawn. And now we are ready. F4 and the upcoming F5 idea is just unstoppable. And uh, it is going to decide the game eventually. Uh, team on second exchange, but uh, the mighty forces of Anand on the e-file proved to be too powerful. It actually fizzled out into an endgame um, like this, where it feels like black might have enough play because of the queenside pawns. But the reality is, is that the heavy pieces are just way too powerful and they penetrate with elementary power and decide the game. So... I tried to give you a bit of uh, an insight into the depth of the book, which I think I kind of did. I couldn't get even remotely close to convey most of the ideas as well as Sokolov does, and in fact, even demonstrate them, especially in the sidelines. But suffice to say that this book um, has been entertaining me now for several days. I love going through the games and the incredibly well detailed and well explained can't emphasize enough, really well explained analysis. So it is an absolute joy. Once again, a difficult and challenging book, but if you are up to this level, boy, are you in for a jolly, jolly good ride and an awesome learning opportunity. Five out of five stars, hands down. Um, when Sokolov's first book came out, I thought that that was a masterpiece. And uh, despite the fact that I think writing a very good book has become far more complicated than 20 years ago because of the presence of the engine and therefore the pressure on authors to present, you know, everything to perfection, yet explain it really well. Wow. Hats off, Ivan Sokolov. This is just next level. So I cannot recommend enough um, winning chess middle games. It is an absolute must for those who would like to climb higher on the rating rather rating ladder and their rating already starts with a two this could be a book um for you and i once again very very highly recommend um you to engage with winning chess middle games that's gonna be it from me guys um thank you very much very much for watching uh, this video please don't forget to sub to like to super thank me if you can we will be back with the next video soon